everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn and it's my great honor and privilege to share this grace encounter with you today. I want to talk to you about rising up again. Take our scripture reading from Proverbs chapter 24 and find some hope. <laughs> oh, I love how the Lord ministers hope regardless of what's happening in the earth. Proverbs 24, I want us to look at verses 15 and 16. The scripture says, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Now, man is in italics, and if you read in your uh, Bibles in the front of it, they'll tell you that the translators put some words in in italics simply to help the reading be smoother so anytime I find this especially in regard to the wicked I don't limit it to wicked people because there's another scripture that refers to Satan Lucifer King of Babylon whatever as wicked okay so the wicked the ultimate wicked all right so lay not wait O wicked man against the dwelling of the righteous spoil not his resting place. Spoil is from the Hebrew word shadad, and it means to ravage, to destroy, to oppress, uh, to spoil. So in other words, don't mess with his rest, okay? For, I mean, why? What's the big deal about this? For, which means because a just man or a righteous man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. So, the Holy Spirit through Solomon is ministering a nugget of wisdom here. And he's helping us understand that when, whether it's people or unclean spirits that set themselves up to spoil the resting place of the righteous... They're setting something in motion against themselves because the righteous is going to rise up again. I mean, that's a given, and I'm going to explain to you why in a few moments. But it says the wicked shall fall into mischief. Mischief is from the Hebrew word ra, and it means adversity, affliction, calamity, distress, misery, sorrow, wretchedness, and trouble. So, a righteous man or a just man falls. That's a given. We all fall. And falleth is from the Hebrew word nawful, and it means to fall, to cast down, to fall down, to fall away, to lie down. And ultimately, it means if you stay in that place, to perish, to cease, to die, and to rot. Okay? What we have to understand... And this was difficult for me in my younger years because I wanted so badly to please the Lord. And anytime I heard something in the scriptures or read something and it spoke to my heart, I wanted to be perfected in it the next day. When I stumbled trying to learn the new concept, I was very hard on myself. And it was, it was difficult for me to forgive myself and... I lived in a constant state of condemnation simply because I tripped. Well, I, I didn't get it. I didn't understand that, it's, that our learning to walk with God is just like a baby learning to walk. And when your baby is learning to walk and it happens to stumble and fall, you don't knock that child around. You pick it up, you comfort it, and you stand it on its little feet and you encourage it to try again, okay? It looks like I would have got that, but I didn't get it. So, we have to understand, things trip us up sometimes. Our dreams get shattered, and it just throws us into a state of despair, and, and we feel like, oh, I just, I can't function. I don't know what to do. We lose loved ones, and nothing devastates like the loss of a loved one. Our hope gets deferred. And the scripture says that when your hope gets deferred, it makes your heart or your core, your inside sick. And there's times that we all want to just lie down and stay down for the count. But inevitably, we find ourselves getting back up. And sometimes we even get angry about that. 
why would why do we keep getting up psalm chapter 37 has got the answer let me read that to you right quick psalm chapter 37 and i want to read verses 23 and 24 it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord and he delighteth in his way though he fall he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And there's the secret. <laughs> the wicked may fall and just get deeper and deeper and deeper into the mischief, the destruction, the calamity, and all of that stuff. But when we fall, we fall into the hand of God. He upholds us, and he encourages us, and he helps us get back up. So though a righteous man falls seven times, he's getting back up. He will raise back up. Upholdeth is from the Hebrew word salmak, and it means to prop up, to take hold of, to bear up, to sustain, and to uphold. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Now, I've shared in previous broadcasts how that when we read about the hand of the Lord, that it means the spirit of the Lord, because God is a spirit. And in two different gospels, you'll find the same account recorded where Jesus was casting out a devil, and they were accusing him of doing it by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And in one gospel, he says, if I, with the finger of God, cast him out, then by whom do your children and cast him out. And another gospel recounting the same event says, if I by the Spirit of God cast him out, then by whom do your children cast him out? So the hand of God, Spirit of God, just make that connection and understand God's Spirit upholds us. He's working in us. He helps us to get back up when we've been knocked down. And that's the reason I love Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 that tells us that God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Another translation says he's working in us both the desire and the performance of his good pleasure. So one of the ways that you can tell that God is working in you is that he puts desires to do things in you. And sometimes that desire is the desire to get back up after you swore you were just checking out of the game. <laughs> I've had that happen to me more times than I can count. And sometimes it just irritates me to no end because I am I'm tired you know I am fed up with trying to uh, do things God's way I'm just being honest here because doing it by faith and doing it by grace sometimes it takes longer than just diving into it and doing stuff with my fists but when I do it God's way the results are always so much better. In the process of time, I have finally begun to learn that a little bit. But it always amazes me how he can change my heart and put the willingness to get up and go again back in me. And I'm no more special to him than you are. He does that for all of us. Now, in Luke chapter 12 and verse 32, the scripture tells us that it's our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom okay he's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom but do you know what there's not a whole lot we can do if we're laying down if we're knocked down and trying to stay down for the count <laughs> we have to get raised back up we have to be willing to stand back up we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And I've shared over and over and over these past months on these YouTube broadcasts that our identity in Christ does not change just because we sin, just because we trip and fall into something, just because we make a mess. Okay, we're very, very conscious of that. But what God is conscious of is the fact that we're in Christ Jesus and his blood is continually 
pouring over us, washing us. We're in him. That blood is circulating over us as part of his body, okay? So we may have fallen into sin. We may have fallen into bankruptcy. I mean, that's a devastating state of affairs, especially if you want to be honorable and pay your bills. And things have happened maybe through no fault of your own, or maybe even it was your fault, and you've fallen into this area of bankruptcy. Or you may have fallen into sickness. Luke chapter 14 and verse 5, Jesus was having lunch at the Pharisee's house one Sabbath, and there was a man there that had dropsy. And so he asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? Of course, you know, they didn't agree with him, but they couldn't fuss because their own hearts were convicting them. But Jesus healed him, and then he asked them the question. He said, which of you, if you have an ox or a donkey fall into a pit, will not go and pull him out on the Sabbath day? So Jesus compared falling into a state of sickness like falling into a pit. And I'm all for, you know, believing and declaring the truths of the gospel of God and the redemption over our lives and the word of faith. That's a powerful and a wonderful thing. But I'm also very well aware that there are times in trying to do that and uphold that and not say negative things or things that agree with the curse against yourself that you can get to feeling condemned if you get sick. And sweetheart, I want to destroy that condemnation right now in the name of Jesus. Jesus said it's like falling in a pit. No big deal. Just get healed. And the way we do that is by letting go of the condemnation and receiving the grace that God has so freely provided for us in Christ Jesus. By his stripe, we were healed. If we were, then we are. And it's just a matter of receiving that and refusing to listen to that voice of condemnation that says, well, there's something wrong with you. You must have done something. You're just so bad. God can't do anything to you. No, my grannies, I may fall down seven times, but I'm going to get up eight. Do you see what I'm saying? Because Jesus is in me and he is raising me up. And there are times I don't feel that way. I don't feel like getting up. But the Holy Spirit never fails to quicken my heart and to start dealing with me and to remind me of what I have in Christ Jesus and to remind me that there are still some good things in this earth worth fighting for and that as long as I have breath of life, I am here for a reason and God can help me get up and face another day. Do you see? It doesn't matter where you fail, or when you fail, or how you fail. What matters is that Jesus is the reason you will get back up. You'll find yourself getting back up and re-engaging with life. I want to read you something out of Luke chapter 2 that is so amazing. And we've, we've kind of caught the first part of it, but I, I myself, I won't speak for anybody else, I myself missed out on the second part of it. I want to read uh, the account where Jesus had been born and his parents had taken him to the temple uh, to offer up the sacrifice for, for him, celebrating that and for Mary's cleansing and all that. And I'm just going to read you the account from the point where Simeon comes in and encounters them. So Luke chapter 2, verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, or the Messiah, the Anointed One. He came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set 
for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Now, previously, I got the part that he was set for the fall because he is the word of grace uh, the, or the word of God made flesh full of grace and truth and that truth came right smack up against you know those people that were so committed to the law that didn't understand that the law could not make them righteous it was there to be a schoolmaster to bring them to faith in Christ and so it, it caused them to have to fall away to turn loose let go of something in order to cleave unto him but it didn't get that part where it said for the rising again of many so Jesus is set not only for the fall but for the rising again of many okay he is the word made flesh as I said full of grace and truth but he's also the stone which the builders rejected and in Luke chapter 20 and verse 18 Jesus himself was speaking and he said whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder. We have to fall on Jesus, the stone, in order to get broken free of our own stupidity. And every time that we turn unto him, every time we ask him for his help, we're more or less treating that stone like an altar. <laughs> we're falling on it. And it's breaking stuff out of us. And that's a good thing. Because the alternative is to keep resisting him to the point that he has to fall on us. And it grinds us to powder as the wicked because, you know, he doesn't grind his children to powder. He helps us get broken free of things. When we receive him as our Savior, he starts working on us from the inside out to put us back together and to raise us up in his likeness more than conquerors. So his goal is for us to rise again. He's set for the fall and the rising again. Of many now rising is from the Greek word anastasis and it means a standing up whether you're talking about a moral recovery of spiritual truth or a literal resurrection from death so we have to understand it is not our birthright or our destiny to stay under Satan's boot or to remain fallen in the pit, whether it's a pit of despair or a pit of sickness or a pit where your hope has been deferred. That's not our destiny. That's not our, our final resting place. Our resting place is resting in Christ. Satan is the enemy that has spoiled our resting place and he's destined to fall into mischief. And he ultimately, I mean, he literally gets a pit and gets to be chained in it for a thousand years. But calamity and misery and trouble, all of that, is heaped up and coming against him. What we have to remember is that we are the third day generation. And I don't care how many times that you and I have fallen. God is reviving us and raising us up and causing us to live in his side. And I, I want to just throw this out here and let you kind of meditate on it and think about it a little bit. Four different times in the book of John chapter 6 where Jesus is revealing himself as the bread of life four different times he said I will raise up at the last day and yes that means the resurrection of the dead but I want to submit to your thinking that the scripture very clearly gives us three days in the book of Hosea he says after two days I will revive him and the third day I will raise him up and cause him to live in my sight. So there's three days, all right? I've shared with you before that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day. So from the time of the cross, we've had 2,000 years. We've stepped over into the third millennia. So this counts as the third day or the last day. There are so many prophetic signs being fulfilled that Jesus testified and said himself, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. We are that generation. So we are being raised up in this last or third day. And yes, ultimately, we're going to see the, the people who died in Christ come out of the graves. But there's also a raising up that's taking place to stand up and to re-engage 
with life and to have purpose and hope and press forward even though 10 minutes ago you were full of despair and exhausted and didn't care if the devil did win every battle. No, 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 no. That's just his thinking that he's trying to project onto you to get you to back out of things and to just sit down and do nothing and because he wants he wants you to feel helpless he wants you to feel like there's no hope he wants you to feel like he has the upper hand but all of that is a lie he does not have the upper hand God is working and every day God is putting Jesus enemies under his feet the very last enemy that shall be destroyed or rendered powerless is death. We are the generation that's moving into that time that's seeing that happen. So don't lose hope and don't be surprised when after you have opened your mouth and said you're just finished, you're done, you're not going to try anymore, that all of a sudden you feel this little kindling starting on the inside of you. You feel this little blaze start flaming up and growing and you find yourself wanting to get back into the mix of things, wanting to take a stand, take a position, speak out for God, do things. You find yourself being revived and refreshed and raising up. And that's what Jesus does. So if you wanted to spend the rest of your life under the enemy's boot, you made the wrong choice when you chose Jesus to be your Savior because he's not going to let you do that. Part of his job description is to raise you back up. <laughs> and though you fall seven times, he's going to do that. So I want to encourage you today. Don't be in condemnation because you fell, whether you fell into sin or whether you fell into financial ruin or whether you fell into sickness. I don't care what form it takes. Jesus is willing to raise you up. And not only is he willing, he's doing it. And there are people that are praying in agreement with that. And you're going to find yourself inspired. You're going to find yourself with new purpose. You're going to find yourself interested again where you were not before. Depression does not have the last word. Financial ruin does not have the last word. Sickness does not have the last word. Jesus Christ, the Amen, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega in Greek, the Aleph Tav in Hebrew, He has the last word. And He's called you victorious. He's called you more than a conqueror. He has called you mighty in spirit. He has called you full of grace and truth. He's called you his child. He's going to raise you up. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and restore unto you all that the locust has eaten. The Lord raise you up and remind you that you are called to have the enemy put under your feet. Shalom to you. The force of righteousness be upon you to do the short work that God has declared that he would do in this earth. The Lord minister that shalom, wholeness, and restoration through righteousness. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, beloved of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, it's so wonderful to remember that we are your beloved, that you first loved us and you demonstrated that love by sending your son to be punished in our place, to take our sins into his own body on the tree so that we could live to righteousness and so that by his stripes we could be healed. Lord, you've done it all for us. You've passed every conceivable love test and I, I know Lord I've talked to you about it before it gets on my nerves that I forget that sometimes but I'm so thankful that you're faithful to remind me and I'm so thankful for the times Lord when I've just been so frustrated and upset with myself that you would just whisper to me I love you <laughs> and you would remind me to just sing that little song Jesus loves me this I know. And how many times, how many times have I experienced 
the weight lifting off of me, the darkness leaving, and being able to get up and move forward again just because I was reminded that you love me. So today, Father, I pray for these people or whoever is hearing this broadcast. And I'm asking you to minister a revelation of the love that you have for them. You've told us in your word in the book of Ephesians that when we know the love of Christ, we'll be filled with the fullness of God. And Lord, we're facing things we don't have a clue how to handle. We need your presence more than ever. So we need revelation of the love of Christ. We need that constant steady reminder of his presence. And I'm so thankful that you've put your Holy Spirit here to do that. So we invite you, Lord, just invade our circumstances today with your love. We declare gladly thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Father, that nothing causes you to be afraid or dismayed. Nothing takes you by surprise. All things are possible with you, and we're with you, and you're with us. That means all things are possible to us, too. Thank you for raising us up. Thank you for encouraging us those times when we're not fit company for man or beast. <laughs> Thank you that you don't despise us and you don't throw us away when we have those moments. You simply pick us up and dust us off and help us to move forward. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ministries in our lives. We receive. Amen. Alrighty, one final thought before I close and go about my business for the day. Uh, I'm going to be moving at some point between December and January. So with Thanksgiving and Christmas preparations and moving, I'm not really sure how many broadcasts I'll be able to do each week. I will try my best to do at least one. I hope and pray God works it out where I can still continue to do two. Because I, I don't do this just so that I'll have something to do to keep me from being bored. <laughs> I do this because for years and years and years, God has had it in my heart to be able to share things that will equip the body of Christ to be able to stand those times when they feel like they're standing alone to feed them things that will strengthen them and encourage them and help them to keep pressing on and I can no more stop doing that than I can stop breathing it's just part of me but sometimes I have time restrictions sometimes my life gets in a you know have a little blips and upheavals and things but God has always been faithful to help me be able to in some way you know, keep getting the word out. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. But I'm just giving you a heads up. If there just happens to be one, or God forbid, if something happens and I can't do any, uh, there's nothing major. You know, it's just I'm, I'm transitioning. I'm stepping into a new season, and that's good. I'm looking forward to it. God's grace is sufficient. But um, I always believe it's just a courteous thing to let people know ahead of time so that they can kind of know what to expect. And with that thought, <laughs> I will say I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day, and I will talk to you later.